Today we flew in a special speaker uh, all the way from Clarendon, Vermont. Uh, his name is Gary. And so would you let Gary know that you love him as he's coming to the platform? So Gary's been a part of Roadside for years and years and years, has preached and has taught and has led groups, small groups. He helps run our growth track. Uh, he's led Royal Rangers. Um, he's a husband, a father, an author. You might not know this, but Gary's an, Gary and Cindy are both authors. And uh, they're just wonderful people. And I said this morning, and I might as well say it again, and, but most of all, he's the best thing that's ever happened to Cindy. Bum, bum. Yeah, okay. Everybody's like, there's a line, and I just think I crossed it. So, <laughs> notice he's smart. He's not saying a word. So, if you need marriage counseling, you might want to come to them as well. So, but uh, without any further ado, I want to hand this over to Gary and just open up your hearts and be ready to receive the word today. Thanks, Benny. Yeah, I know who's better off in this deal. So, my, I, I'm pretty blessed to have my wife who put up with me for 44 years. 44 years. So, all right, well, today I'm happy to talk to you about something I know a lot about, unraveling the secrets of sheep. Um, and you know, I thought before I start this message I should give you my credentials. You know, I mean, people talk all the time about being experts. Well, I'm an expert on sheep. And so I thought I should give you my credentials before we start. So my first credential is right here. I'm going to get it. So this is my first credential. <laughs> this is Lammy. Okay. Now, the story behind Lammy is that my kids and I used to, we used to all go to Cape Cod. And one time when we were at Cape Cod, we saw somebody having a lawn sale where they just threw all the stuff on a sheet, kind of. You know, you see those where they put a tarp out, they just put a junk of junk out there, and they say, for sale. Um, so we were driving by at Cape Cod, and we saw a lamb sitting on the tarp. And my kids are, oh, isn't he cute? we got to get the lamb. And I'm like, we are not stopping and getting that lamb off the tarp. So for four days straight, we drove by Lamb, and it got more insistent to the point where when we were driving by, we'd hear, take me, take me, you know? My, the kids would be, you know, making the voice of the Lamb. And I just got so tired of listening to it that on the fifth day, when we were getting ready to leave, and they were all whining and complaining, you know, kids, you know, um, I finally said, fine, we'll stop and we'll take the stupid Lamb. So we drive by, and there's the sale, and Lammy was gone. No lamb. My kids didn't talk to me for a week, except for Jim, because he can't not talk. But the girls didn't talk to me for a week. Um, and then for Christmas, for my present, I opened up a present, and out popped Lammy. They bought me a lamb for Christmas, because they knew how heartbroken I was over not getting Lammy. So that's the first reason I'm an expert on lambs. Anyway, uh, the second reason is because when I was 18 years old, I went to UMass and I was going to become a veterinarian. So I was going to—I studied large animal veterinary medicine, um, and I found out pretty quickly. We went down to the sheep pens that they had on campus. They, they had a whole farm basically there. And so they took us all down to the sheep pens and we were going to learn how to make sheep not have more sheep, if you follow what I mean. <laughs> and so the way they did it, the way they did it, I better, the way they, the way they did it back then, at least at UMass, was that we would take hot pruning shears. You'd have a fire going, and you'd put the pruning shears in the hot fire, and the lambs were a day old, and they'd be sitting there going, bah, 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 you know, nice and peaceful. And they'd tell us, don't worry, they won't feel a thing. So, and I was the first one in the line, so they handed me the shears and say, go at it. <clears throat> and so I did. And they lied to me because the sheep did feel it. Because that little lamb started going, ah, 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 
And I started screaming too. <laughs> because it scared me so bad that when I did it, you, you get it. Yeah. So it was shortly after that experience that I changed my major from pre in medicine to just animal science. Because I decided that making lambs not have more lambs wasn't for me. You can come out now. So that is how I became an expert on sheep. So are you all OK with my credentials as an expert on sheep? Yeah. Good thing. All right. So now that we agree that I'm an expert on sheep, we're going to talk about sheep and how they have to do with scripture. So. Without further ado, here we go about sheep. The first thing I wanted to talk to you about sheep was from Scripture because in Isaiah 53, 6, it says, We all, like sheep, have gone astray. Each of us has turned to our own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. Now, have you ever wondered why does Scripture talk about sheep? I mean... They're everywhere in scripture. Really, you know, you could, you could write a book about sheep just out of the scriptures in the Bible about sheep. So I, I thought that was kind of weird because this scripture seems to imply that all sheep will stray. And I, I guess that's true. Is it true? I guess it's true. All sheep want to stray. There's another scripture I wanted to bring up. Ezekiel 34.11 says that I myself will search for my sheep and will seek them out. Why so much talk about sheep in Scripture? I mean, we always look at it and say, Oh, well, they use that because Jesus is the shepherd and we're the sheep and he's going to go seek us out. Right? Right? That's the theological view. I'm here to talk about sheep, not theology. Even if I'm in church. So I found myself saying, why sheep? Why not cows, or goats, or turtles, or frogs? Why sheep? Huh? Anybody want to know why sheep? Yes. All right, I'm glad you're with me. All right, so we're going to find out why sheep. Here's the thing. I just, I just read this a little while ago, and it caught my attention. Sheep have peripheral vision of 320 degrees. That's the secret to why we're going to talk about sheep today. You see, that vision is a real problem for sheep. Why do we always read about the shepherd having to go find the lost sheep? Sheep, by nature, want to be in the flock. So why do they keep getting lost? The reason is because they have 320 degree vision. You see what happens is the sheep puts his face down there and he starts grazing. Right? But out of the corner of his eyes, because he can see so well, he sees some grass out of the peripheral vision. Ooh, that grass looks good. So without ever lifting their head, they kind of move over and they chew on that grass. You know, and they're nibbling away, happy, and then they, they, you know, they nibble, and then they nibble, and then they nibble, and then they nibble. You get the idea? Yeah. So what happens to the sheep? They get lost. One sheep expert who is probably a little more qualified than me, is quoted as saying that sheep will nibble their way to lostness. They nibble their way to being lost. I was struck with the fact that the scripture says, all we like sheep have gone astray. Do you know the purpose for why we were created in the first place? The purpose of why we were created is that we can have an intimate love relationship with our Creator. He created us to be part of His flock. He created us to be intimately involved in Himself. 
He wants to have that relationship with us. In fact, you will never be satisfied unless you're part of his flock. We try to be satisfied. We think some person is going to keep us happy, make us fulfilled and satisfied. We think that some job is going to do it. We think that having money or things is going to do it. But the reality is, because God created us to be part of his flock, we'll never be satisfied if we're not part of his flock. Everyone has nibbled their way to lostness at some point. We want to serve God, but while we're trying to serve God, we see something out of the peripheral vision. We see something that looks pretty good. That, ooh, that grass is pretty good. And we think we're still serving God, but we've nibbled our way away. The reason sheep nibble their way to lostness is, is not because they want to be lost, but because they're seeing out of the peripheral vision things that seem better than what's in front of them. I'm fully convinced that if they actually took a close look, they'd see that it wasn't really any better at all. But, you know, out of the side view, it can look pretty good. All right, so they got 320-degree vision. Awesome. And they nibble their way to lostness. And we're going to come back to that later. But there's more things about sheep you need to understand about why Scripture uses them so much. The next one is that sheep have no sense of direction. They just follow the leader, whoever it is, wherever it is. Now, normally they have shepherds that lead them, but they'll follow whoever. That first sheep is following the shepherd, everybody else is following. I read once that they did an experiment and they put a rope across the barn door just high enough that the sheep had to jump over the rope to get out of the barn door. So the first one jumps over, the second one jumps over, the third one, and at some point they pulled the rope away. The rest of the sheep all jumped over anyway <laughs> because they were following the one in front and the one in front jumped, so they jump. It gets worse than that. Sheep will wander wherever. If they don't have a shepherd, they'll go wherever. The flock can be completely lost. They'll follow whoever's leading them. And if it's not the shepherd, they'll follow the sheep in front. I read recently that in eastern Turkey, 1,500 unattended sheep, while the shepherd, by the way, was eating breakfast, the 1,500 sheep went off a cliff because the first one led them off the cliff and all the rest of them followed. Fortunately for them, only the first 400 died because the rest of them landed on top of a fluffy object and they survived. So only 1,100 of them survived, but the first 400 weren't so lucky. They have no sense of direction. Now the next thing you want to know about sheep is that they're very valuable, especially in biblical times. Back in biblical times, more so than today, sheep were considered extremely valuable. In fact, if you had a herd of sheep, you were considered a wealthy person. You were wealthy if you owned sheep. I mean, they provided money, they provided food, they provided wool. They were a valuable object for shepherds. So we know that sheep have 320 degree vision we know that they have no sense of direction. We know that they're valuable. So now this little sheep wanders off. And remember I told you, you know, the shepherd, why is the shepherd under normal circumstances, not getting theological here, you know, just, you know, why does the shepherd in the biblical times go after that sheep? He's worth money to him. He wants the sheep back because it's valuable to him. We'll get to the theological stuff in a minute. But, 
you know, he's valuable to him. Now that poor sheep, imagine that poor little sheep. He's wandered off, nibbled his way to lostness. It's getting dark. The sheep looks up and said, uh, where am I? Huh? And it's getting dark. He hears weird noises like animals. A little heart gets pounding, I would think, because it hasn't got a clue where it is. Terror would begin to fill that lamb's heart, I think. And then imagine the joy when that shepherd comes along calling out. And he hears the shepherd's voice and he goes to the shepherd. He's rescued. Remember where we started in the verse, Isaiah 53, 6. We all, like sheep, have gone astray. Each of us has turned our own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. The reason Scripture uses this analogy is because it's true. God created us to be part of that flock. He loves us. He wants to care for us. He wants to provide for us. He wants to protect us. He wants to nurture us. And yet, as we see in Isaiah, we've all gone astray. We've all sinned. Romans 3.23, theological now. Romans 3.23, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And the reality is, every person in this room, if you think about it, acknowledges, yep, I've done wrong. I might be a good person, but I don't have a clean slate. I can say that for myself anyway. What's more, if you've never accepted Christ as your Savior, you know that you are not part of the flock. Inside, deep down, you know you're missing something. And the reason you're missing something is because you're not part of the flock. The sins in our life, big and small, have called us from the flock. And be sure of this. The wolves don't generally attack the flock. They attack, they attack the strayers, the ones who have been culled from the flock. If they attack the flock, what do they do? They try to get one of them culled from it, and then they attack. The wolves attack. Some of us, even though we know Christ is our Savior, have peripheral vision. We see all the temptations around us, and although we want to serve God, we like the nibble. Transparency here, I like to nibble. I kid about my daughters and my kids sometimes saying, oh, I like to see how close to the edge of the cliff they can go without falling off. Any of you have kids, you know what I mean. But I can tell you, I can say that about myself. There's times where I like to nibble. I know I shouldn't, but I see it and I nibble. We have to be sure that the wolves are circling. Because before we know it, we could nibble our way to lostness. John 10, 11, 15. Long verse of scripture. I am the good shepherd. Now we're into the theological stuff, people. But this is the good stuff. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. The hired hand is not the shepherd and does not do that. Doesn't own the sheep. So when he sees the wolf coming, he abandons the sheep and runs away. Then the wolf attacks the flock and scatters it. The man runs away because he's a hired hand and cares nothing for the sheep. I am the good shepherd. I know my sheep. My sheep know me, just as the Father knows me, and I know the Father, and I lay down my life for the sheep. Aren't you glad that Jesus Christ is the good shepherd? Yes. Jesus knows us. He loves us. If you wander off, he comes looking for you. You know what? There's never been a time where I have nibbled and not had Jesus come looking for me. He comes and he says, Gary, what are you doing? <laughs> Hello. 
What are you doing? He loves me. So when I nibble, he comes after me. You remember we said sheep are valuable? You may say, I'm not valuable. You're wrong. You are very valuable to the shepherd. In fact, you are priceless to the shepherd. You may say, oh, I'm not really part of the flock. I, have, I haven't done this Jesus stuff. The next slide, we add verse 15. I have other sheep that are not in this sheep pen. I must bring them also. They too will listen to my voice and there shall be one flock and one shepherd. Yes. Even though you don't know Jesus Christ as your Savior, even though you're in a position where you say, I'm not a very good person. Jesus says, I have come to bring you into my flock. Oh, Gary, you don't know me. Well, you don't know me. <laughs> you don't know me, but it doesn't matter, you see, because Jesus came despite everything about you, because despite everything you think about you that's bad, Jesus loves you. Romans 5, 8. But God demonstrates his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Is that awesome or what? Yes. You don't have to be better to get saved. You don't have to be, I shouldn't use the word saved, sorry, theology. But you don't have to be better to come to Christ. You don't have to clean up your act. So many people think, well, when I stop doing this, I'll, I'll come to Christ. I'll accept Jesus as my Savior. That's not the way it works. You don't clean up and then come to Christ. You come to Christ and then he helps you clean up. Amen. That's the way it works. You are so much more valuable to God than a sheep is to a shepherd. So much so that Jesus came to rescue you just the way you are. And he did it with joy. Hebrews 12, 1 and 2 says, Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher for our faith. Why? Who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross and death. Think about that. What was that joy he did this for? It says he was looking unto the joy. Vinny was the joy. Nate was the joy. Paul was the joy. Gary was the joy. We were the joy that was set before Jesus. And he said, yes, I will go. I will die. I will rise again in order to save them from their sins so that they can be part of my flock. Amen. You know, and what's really cool, and I absolutely believe this with all my heart, if I was the only person in the world who needed to be saved from my sins, Jesus would have still said, I love him, I will give my life for him. Yes. You were the joy that was set before him. And if that's not awesome, I don't know what is. No matter where you are, no matter what you've done, Christ died for us. Think about the sheep out there. Why don't we get the worship team to come back up? Think about that sheep out there. If it were possible for a sheep to talk, and of course, Lammy can talk, because he talks to me all the time, <laughs> but nothing I can repeat here. Um, <laughs> if the sheep could talk in that situation where we, he was lost, Hopeless, wild animals. The sheep would be saying, Shepherd, help me. Rescue me. Save me. Some of us are like that. 
You feel lost. You feel hopeless. You know you're not part of the flock. Well, I have good news for you. He came. He died. He rose again. And because of that, you can be part of the flock. You can be set free from your sins. You can be set free from things that are habits. You can, not, you can be helped if you've nibbled away.